at the stream might end early potentially i'm not sure um because it is now snowing all the time always it never stops it never melts um so uh i have to give dalton a ride later because he has a car that does not have four-wheel drive so his wife like tried to drive somewhere earlier uh in the car and almost died <laughs> because of like the ice and shit she's got a rear wheel drive two wheel car two wheel drive car which is the worst you could possibly have in the snow so uh at some point i gotta go like pick him up and so you gotta go buy groceries or something uh but it kind of depends i don't know when that's gonna be could be in like two hours could be in three hours could be in eight hours i don't know so but i'm just giving you the warning we could suddenly stop but really isn't that like that's like a lesson about uh life uh, you know like like at any time it could all suddenly stop you know what i'm saying speaking of we've died twice already in the game we're playing today the life and suffering of emily bronte <laughs> of goose bronte of sir bronte Emily Bronte sucks, right? Aren't those books, like, fucking garbage? They made us read them in school, which means I don't know if they're actually bad or if just I have terrible memories of them because we, we were forced to read them. Because school is designed to make you hate reading. The goose is loose. The goose is loose in the city. The city is now getting goosed. You know what I'm saying? Goose chapter 3. Uh, if you haven't been following, we're 17 years old, and despite our young, youthful age, we've been released onto the city, and they don't know what's about to fucking hit them. Uh, there are also, like, riots and shit in the city. Not quite race riots. We're gonna work on that. We're gonna try and make those race riots happen. Um, what's your favorite medieval holy order? I don't know, dude. I would need to research that more. Um, there are only a few days left until the Imperial College entrance exam. History, law, theology. You spend all day reading and rereading the books you brought with you. Staying at the Library of Eterna for hours, sometimes until it closes. As the day of the exam approaches, your hands start shaking more and more. Finally, the day comes. Yeah, you, you know how when I study, I just have my Bible surrounded by my fucking whip and my cross sword. I, I wish that was true, the things that I'm saying, because this looks really cool. Again, I point out the fact that this is a completely different religion that has nothing to do with Christianity in any way. And so the cross has absolutely no symbolism at all. They just have crosses on their stuff because... Looks cool. Looks cool, I guess. Doesn't make any sense. A clear sky hangs over Eterna today. The war the breeze is warm. The warm is breeze. You dress in your best outfit, a gray jacket and velvet culotte trousers. You comb your hair carefully and polish your boots until they shine. You leave the lodging house and head for the Imperial College. Your legs grow heavier with each step. Your anxiety at the, f at the fact your fate will be decided today is virtually tearing you apart. I thought my fate was decided the day I was born, but then the game just fucking lied to me and changes all the time. I'm Big Brother of the Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem. So, the, twins, the two sticks crossed represent the twins. That doesn't make any sense. That's dumb. That doesn't make no sense. So, the college is a majestic building that looks not unlike a castle. In the square in front of it, you can already see several dozen men. Young men, sons of nobles of the mantle like you, waiting for the college's doors to open. Time slows to a crawl. At last, the doors open. A stately man dressed in a professor's mantle appears at the entrance. He is the dean of the college. The students to f be to be fall silent. The students to fail. I thought that said for a second. As the deans get ready to deliver his welcoming speech, but the silence is interrupted by heavy footsteps and clanking armor. A squadron of warriors emerge near the near the college. I really need to just like I'm just gonna turn my phone off. I'm just gonna turn my phone. I'm just gonna turn the ringer off. Just that's this is becoming a problem. I'm too popular now. Led by Arknian officers. Their banner bears an image of golden grains. The noble militia of the Monia province. What are they doing here? The nobles of Monia form a circle around the college. Eat, give me a map, dude. Give me a map. Where's Monia? Monia is here. Ah! The Mon Rogues. Who have, uh... Oh, wait. I was thinking of the fucking Illyria. That's the place where they got gunpowder and stuff. I was thinking of that. No, no, no. This is the nobles... These are the where all the lots are denied any freedom whatsoever. 
Interesting, interesting. Yeah, the golden grains. Ah, I see, okay. Garcia? <laughs> what a name. Each warrior moving quietly and precisely until a chain is formed. One of the Arcnians is clad in an old-fashioned suit of armor. He's the leader of the militia. He locks the bar on the massive doors of the college into place, then proceeds to the stairs to address the, clo the crowd loudly. School's closed! <laughs> For summer. School's closed forever. Commoners, before you stand Egerius, Egerius of the Monrogue dynasty, Archduke of Mania. Archduke of Mania, he has, he's indifferent to me. Uh, the most powerful lord in the empire. Oh, interesting. He runs his land in full accordance to the traditions of old, yet the Monian army is said to be invincible. Yet? 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 Why yet? You know how traditions destroy armies, typically. But this man, despite following traditions, has a good has a good army. Yet, one of the foremost opponents of granting the lowly estate new freedoms and rights. Books always lie to you, you can never trust them. Okay, true. <laughs> I get all my information off the internet, off of Twitter. By my will, you don't, what? You're not in charge. The college is hereby closed. Okay, so he doesn't follow all the, all the traditions? I just like to make, I just want to, let me just make sure. Uh, traditionally, um, Eterna is not under con the control of Monia. Am I wrong? Or is that the, the tradition which he is now breaking? And yet I was under the impression that he followed all the traditions. I'm pretty sure, like, having a civil coup is not, like, a like a tradition. <laughs> Maybe it is. Maybe we're, like, Romans, and that's, like, a long-standing tradition by now. Your lowly origins make you unfit for the great honor of rendering service to the Empire. A right that is only... That ought... That ought to be... Out to be. A right that ought to be available only to the hereditary nobles of the sword. The college's reputation has been tarnished. It breeds mock nobles who bear not a trace of noble blood. Is that because I kicked that guy out who's fucking faked? He's Arctian. He makes the rules. He makes up what tr what was tradition. That's not how tradition works. I know he would probably like to think that, but that's not... You belong in the lowly estate, but have forgotten your place. Cornelius Tempest and the other traitors to the Empire are indulging you, and defacing the institution of the nobility with their, for their lowly interests. A noble lot for those of lowly birth. How can this be? I will not stand for this disintegration of the Imperial Order. Now turn away from the college this instant and return to your humble trades of your ancestors. Plow your fields, mend your boots, and work and suffer by your lot. If any of you dares to set foot upon these stairs, you'll be killed at once. The students-to-be meet this speech with a stunned silence. The crowd in the square is growing, however. The news of the Monian noble militia and the college's closing spreads through the streets like wildfire. More humans join the crowd. College students, commoners, officials who worked hard to be ennobled. Unrest grows around you. You hear people calling to rush Archduke Monrogue's forces to take control of the college. RACE WAR! To take control of the college and defend your right to become noble. The Emperor himself gave us this right. We have, to, we have to fight for it! This is a decisive moment for all of you. The old gentry has challenged you. Will you accept this challenge? In the face of this shameful, illegal act, I'm pretty sure laws are tradition, dude. Just wanna like, just wanna say... Is he calling the brother of the Emperor a traitor? He's calling just fucking everyone a traitor, dude. You may prove that all you de all you deserve the noble lot. Mm. You will need to break through the cordon, get inside the college, and take control of it. The no <laughs> yo, we're about to fucking besiege. We're about to besiege a, a school. <laughs> what is this Vietnam? The nobles will never dare hurt you if your presence is strong enough. If you're ready to risk it all and fight for your right for to the nobility, you will have to lead the charge. People keep coming to the square in the meantime, including students and teachers from the Divine Seminary. The lot of the clergy is to guide others in the right to the right path. When the estates clash, the priests are bound to intervene. The seminary teachers instruct their students to form a line between the noble militia and the outraged crowd. The priests begin telling the war warrior nobles and the riotous commoners to return to the preordained divine order, lest they provoke the wrath of the gods. 
the wrath of the gods. As the priests utter these words, the crowd around you disappears. A vision appears before your eyes. The empire is ablaze. You see burning land steeped with pain and despair everywhere you look. Rivers overflowing to extinguish the burning world. You can tell that soil scorched by such fire will never bear fruit again. That doesn't make any sense. What is it, fucking magic fire? Is it burning salt? Fire makes land extremely more fertile. What does it mean? What are they talking about? Weather snowing. Vinegar poured. Sausage cut. Is that a circumcision joke? Salt taken. Yep, it's yeoman time. <laughs> My tradition says laws are dumb, and I shouldn't follow them because they're dumb and I'm cooled and based. Ha ha, red-pilled. I see we have a fellow American talking in chat. <laughs> Isn't it? So I heard this said the other day, and I think it's actually a really good point. Um, somebody was trying to talk about, like, how do we keep American identity while being against America as a country? Because America as a country is, like, fucking evil. And then someone else pointed out the fact that anti-Americanism is a long-standing American tradition. <laughs> and it's like, yeah! Yeah! I love my country, which is exactly why I hate my country! The God-given vision demands to be heard. Demands to be prophesied to the world. But only a priest may speak to the twins and for the twins. Will you keep it inside, or will you step onto the path the twins have revealed to you? Being anti-American is essentially American. Somebody shoves you in the back and you snap out of the vision. You turn around to see a small but decisive troop of commoners moving quickly through the crowd. They are led by Sophia. As soon as she sees you, she signals to them to stop. Plus one, indifferent, still trusting. Interesting, even after I told her you're a fucking witch, you get out of my fucking house. She's like, I like this dude, I really trust this dude, he's a good guy. So you're here too. That's how women are. <laughs> That's actually how women are. Yeah, cheers, dude. Uh, you did die for her. True. So you're here too. Going to rush the college, are you? Can't you see it already? The laws cannot be trusted. They gave you the right to study here just to throw you a bone. When the going gets tough, your masters will take it all away. It's time for you to decide. We are the lotless, and we are not putting up with this system any longer. We will fight for a new world. Are you coming with us, or are you going to submit to them? There are students and professors locked inside the college. Who knows how long Monroe will maintain the siege, and what if they start slaughtering people? Neither group of nobles will care what happens to them. We're going to go inside and pull them out. Come with us if you're ready to take control of your own destiny. The tension in the square is palpable. The situation is about to implode. I go home and study my Bible again. Students, commoners, nobles of the mantle, followers of the new faith, all of them are gathering their forces to move on the wall of soldiers. They expect the nobles to let them through en masse. Surely they won't start a massacre. The lotless led by Sophia prepare to break through the siege to rescue the people in the college. And all the while the priests preach peace to each side of the conflict. The college is your only way into nobility. Only you can fight for your new lot and fulfill your duty to your family. You can organize an offensive strong enough to get into the college and thus seize your lawful right like a true nobleman. Yet the, I understand what my choices are. It's really fucking taking its time to make sure I understand that I have four distinct choices here. But, uh, mm, she should like you more. She's mad because you won't lie and break the law. Bad friend, bad influence. That's true. It's what the Japanese thought about Americans, that hating the government is a weakness, when actually it's the biggest strength of America. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once revealed, this vision will take you on a different... Oh, wait. The revelation about the wrath of the gods still pulses in your mind. Once revealed, this vision will take you on a different path. Standing with the priests and preaching all that you've seen, warning all of the dire dangers on the path of warring estates, bring the twins' word to the people and guide them to salvation. Could this be your new lot? No fucking chance. Sophia, maybe next time. It's Sophia and the Lotless, they expect you to join their struggle. They are waiting for you to cast off the old ways and the eternal yoke of subservience. If you choose this path, you will not change your lot, and your suffering will continue. But your suffering might just change this world. This is the moment. Your future life will be decided here and now. Well, because my diplomacy and valor is fucking great, actually, yeah, either one would have been, I'm way better than enough. I can get the path of the nobleman, which is probably what I'm going to do. I can't preach because I'm not good. 
And I could follow the lot list because you don't have to be good at anything to follow the lot list. That's kind of the whole point. They're kind of shit at everything. Because we literally live in a system where if, if you're good at something, you can just earn your own rights. Yes, somewhat of an exception right now, but generally, you can just earn your own rights at any time. And these people are just so shitty that they can't. They, they don't do that. But they're mad about being so shitty. You know what I'm saying? So I'm obviously going to break through these fucking pussies, dude. <laughs> Ebro, a new job and every day you stream e have off. Wow! That, well, thank you for the donation, Magnus. How, how convenient. You can make the stream more often. You know what I mean? Every day you have off. Stream. I'm streaming. That's, you have this, that means you have the same schedule as I do for my job. But, but thank you. 18 months. That's impressive. All right, we're breaking through. We're fucking leading a charge against these... Uh, against these... How much does Twitch enjoy fake racial slurs? You know what I mean? Arcs. Fucking arcs, dude. You get to work. Recalling the books on military tactics you used to study as a boy. You call out to the students and the children of nobles around you and assume command. They hear you and they listen. You stand together in close formation and march towards the weakest link in the line of nobles. More people joining you along the way. A veritable phalanx of young men, armed with nothing but determination against the noblemen's swords. The noble militia readies their steel. The Arknian officer in command of the section halts you and orders you to turn back. You step forward and give him your reply. These people are here to study at the college as the Emperor himself has decreed. You have every right to fulfill the, fulfill the imperial law, and any nobles who dare to intervene will be defiring Uther Tempest II himself. Your plan works! The officer hesitates, <laughs> and based on this noise, you beat the shit out of him. <laughs> Recalling my elite naval SEAL training. <laughs> the officer hesitates when confronted with your words and your vigor. <laughs> Yo, dude, lots of people hesitate when they encounter my vigor, you know what I'm saying? The noble militia is no longer ready to use their swords. This is your chance. You command your forces to focus their advantage in numbers for a singular push, and the militia line breaks. You reach the college gates. More people start running for the breach. The nobles get their bearings quickly enough to restore the line, but your phalanx is already inside! You waste no time and begin barricading the gate. The students who are stuck inside the college run toward you. You quickly tell them your plan. Block all the doors and windows with whatever comes to hand before Monrogue's forces can get in. If they do get in, only the twins know what, will ha what they will do. One by one, all the entrances are swiftly barricaded. The plan is simple. We lock the doors, we cross our fingers, and we starve to death. Trust me, I have a very high diplomacy stat. The riot outside the college has calmed down for a moment, it seems. Through an open window, you hear Monroe giving orders to his militia. The Archduke is forming a strong perimeter, 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 perimeter around the college, ready for a proper siege. Students and pr professors of the college go to the balcony to negotiate. You are among them. Surrender and leave this building. I am not here to kill or execute you. No loyal subjects will die by my hand. The humans boo and jeer at Monrogue's proposal. The Dean himself appears at the balcony. The Imperial family established the college, he claims, and he cannot define orders given by the great Arknian Tempest dynasty. And so the college remains besieged. The noble militia stands in a circle around the building. Man, it really is smart of me to have a vision of buildings burning down, and then in a tough situation with a hostile force, I lock myself inside of a building that could easily be burnt down and has good reason to be burnt down. Really was quite smart of me. I guess I'm just fucking suicidal and I've always wanted to be burnt to death, you know? I've always, I've loved being burnt to death. You really are skipping over how much it took to get Sir Bronte at this point versus people who didn't get the chance by circumstances. Uh, what about my grandfather who also did the same thing? What about my father, who also did the same thing? What about Tomas, who was poor as shit and had no advantages at all, and who also did the same thing? It seems like you're skipping over all of the actual details of the plot. <laughs> <laughs> and so the college remains besieged. The noble militia stands in a circle around the building, but there are no preparations for an assault. The outrage in the square continues. 
You remain in control of the college for the entire day and the following night. But at sunrise, the Emperor's Herald arrives in the square. He brings news. The Emperor is delighted to see Archduke Monrogue in the capital, and he demands the noble militia of Mon Mania vacate the square and allow classes to begin at the college. My friend! I'm happy to see you besieging my college! Could you stop besieging my college? Thanks. I want to go out for, like, tea or something. Please just stop starting a civil war. <laughs> My friend, I love you, but could we, could you stop with the siege of civil war? <laughs> it's really a little bit rude. Could you stop with the civil war? Thanks. The besieged college celebrates the news. This is the work of Cornelius Tempest. It's my work. Me. I did that. Great Chancellor, the Emperor's brother. He managed to convince the Emperor to order Monroe to withdraw. Even a, the Archduke of Mania, the most powerful noble lord in all the Empire, cannot disobey a direct order from the Emperor. Still, the college would never have held out for an entire day without your phalanx's determination and your daring plan. That was an entire day? It felt like it was ten minutes. Held out for, like, fucking all of ten minutes. You, the people of the common estate, have secured your right to study and earn the noble lot. The college is open again, and the entrance exam will take place in a few days. You aren't nervous at all this time. Wait, why am I here? It starts in a few days? I just came by? I was... What am I doing here? You aren't nervous at all this time. All the lessons at home, the books, the schooling, your own noble actions, all that work and effort has reached its culmination. The procedure for appointing a provincial overseer. For the five great Arcanian dynasties, the property rights of all estates, you answer all these questions with ease. Tomas's parents were actually pretty well off, and the life of the typical suffering lot do menial tasks that won't make any money to ever get the education you need. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe you just fucking work harder. I have no evidence. What you're saying there is no evidence for as of yet, so I'd just be taking your word for it, which is what I believe we call a spoiler. Uh, but so far in the game, literally none of that has been even uh, hinted at, so... Hours pass, and the dean of the- It sounds like these people are just fucking butthurt because they don't try hard enough. I'm just saying. <laughs> And the dean of the college reads the names of the new students to the young men gathered at the college steps. Your name is among the first. He praises what you did in defense of the college. People like you are the Empire's future, Sir Bronte, he says. My name is Goose, please. Tom Tomas's dad is an artisan, you dummy. Yeah, I mean, okay. Was Thomas's dad's dad an artisan? Was the dad of his dad an artisan? How far back do we go? Have they been artisans for all time? They were born into into wealth? Or did one of them work hard enough to become an artisan at one point? You know what I'm saying? There's not a correct answer because we have no idea. You're, you're just speculating in the opposite direction of where I'm speculating. You know? So... Sunlight fills the college square. It feels so soft and soothing here in Eterna. Not as harsh as it gets in Anazot. You watch the pillars shine in the sky as you walk down the steps of the college. You're a Bronte, the third judge in the family, the man who will soon join the family's noble blood tide. I, is the noble blood tide separate than the other blood tide? Because I'm already a part of the blood tide. If you don't recall, you have seized your right to achieve the nobleman's lot. My Vic 2 economy screen says they're starving. <laughs> Artisans? Yeah. Well, you should write to your father now. He'd, he'll be so proud of you. Cheers. I got a Chivo. Nice, dude. Nice. Easy. Nice. You return to the lodging house one last time to gather your belongings for the move to your new home. A young man dressed in uniform of the military academy greets you by the door. It takes you a moment to recognize Tomas. Yo, you look much better. Like, like, he looks way better than he did when he was a kid when he looked like an old ass man. Your friend locks you in an embrace. In an embrace. Bronte! He loves me, by the way. Affection. Bronte, hey, how are you? I heard about the nasty stuff that went down at the college square. Those damn gentry would do anything to keep lowborn folks under their thumb. Glad the situation resolved itself. As for me, I'm an academy cadet now. He's beaming with pride. You invite him in, in and chat while you pack. Tomas continues to relay the news as you walk up the stairs. I made it into the top ten! Oh yeah, he's poor. He was barely able to get by. He was barely able to, with his father working as an artisan, barely able to get into the fucking school. He got top ten, by the way. He's really good. He's just fucking... <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. 
Did pretty well in sparring and the sciences. It was all thanks to the help you gave me back in the school in Anazote. I'll be studying the art of war now. And then a quick march to a noble title. How about you? You tell Tomas about what happened over the past few days and the path you've chosen. He remains quiet as you speak. Both of you realize that you may never see each other again, except we'll be seeing each other, like, fucking tomorrow. You know, Bronte, here's what I think. You may have your own path in life, but you're my friend. Well, I'm, we're, we gotta make sure our friendship lasts forever, no matter what happens to us. Will you marry me? <laughs> Here! I brought two brass rings. If the old tradition is to be believed, both the rings and their wearers will always remain close to each other, no matter what fate takes them. What do you say? The two of you grew up side by side. Tomas, the audacious, hot-blooded, sharp-tongued boy who used to live next door. You can't imagine your childhood without him. But would it be right to promise him that your friendship will last forever, no matter what happens? Two rings made of plain brass lie in his open palm. If you wear these rings, you'll be bound for, by ties of friendship for the rest of your life. I don't see why you wouldn't do that. Um, but also, like... Don't you just do blood brothers, you know what I mean? Fucking your blood, my, that seems like better, but whatever. Yeah, fine, whatever. Square an oath of friendship, we get a bond of friendship, and we're bound by friendship. Take the ring. You take the ring, which is just the same as a bond of friendship. I'm just not swearing an oath. Oh! I could do take the ring if he... If I'm not a nobleman, but we're still really good friends. But I don't have to do that because I am a nobleman. I see. That Actually, that'd be an interesting one. Keep things as they are, which just gives me willpower, and we remain friends. Or end the friendship, which is fucking wild. And that's only if I'm not a nobleman. Wait, what? Wait, what? So if I'm a nobleman, I only have the choice of swearing an oath of friendship or staying friends. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just interesting. You're not- if you're a nobleman, you are not allowed to stop being friends with him. Well, I'm gonna swear an oath of friendship, there's no fucking doubt. But even though it is slightly homosexual, it seems, it's kind of strange. I prefer the Bud Blood Brothers things. Although, if you are gay, I'd be kind of cautious about swapping blood with you, you know? AIDS, you know what I'm saying? But, you take one of the rings from his outstretched palm. The two of you have walked side by side ever since you were children. And now you are walking in the same direction towards a noble title. You as a judge, and Tomas as a warrior. Nothing will ever tarnish your bond. You swear an oath of eternal friendship to Tomas. Tomas solemnly swears the same. It's weird that I didn't get to choose to like be a warrior instead of a judge, because I may have done that, but okay. Thanks, game. You put the brass ring on your pinky, a perfect fit. Pinky? On your pinky? Why? What a this gay. It's so weird. He starts beaming again. Now we're friends forever. For all eternity. We gotta celebrate this. Come, come. I know a place. Stop, stop. This is like too much, Tomas. Tomas, you just like asked me to marry you and then you said come, come, okay? I know a place. I gotta show you. Tastiest meat I ever had, Bronte. My treat. The two of you go to a noble salon, salon, salon by... The square, we get our hair cut? Surrounded by tobacco smoke and mead bottles, you wag your tongues, recall the days of your adolescence, and make plans for the future. Nobody knows what could be waiting for you, but you promise each other you'll never lose sight of each other. Your friendship is strong enough to stand the test of time. I hope he doesn't fucking, like, betray me or something. I hope this game isn't lying to me. I'm gonna feel real bad about that. German police wear chain mail now. Because... Okay. That has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> as soon as you're accepted into the Imperial College, you send a letter back home. The family replies quickly. Their letter arrives in under a week. Most of it is covered in your father's handwriting. I'm proud of you, my son. And I believe your grandfather takes pride in you, too. You've brought our family one step closer to being ennobled by the sword. You'll make an excellent judge. I have complete faith in your intellect and your will. You shall join bring glory to the family. I would just like to point out, am I technically any closer to getting ennobled by the sword? Is that actually true? Have I actually gotten any closer at all? Because in order to get my family ennobled by the sword, I basically have to marry someone who's ennobled by the sword, right? I mean, like, and I could have done that at any time. Like, is it likely? Yeah, it's, it's like more likely now than it was, because what kind of noble would marry a com- Oh, wait. 
<laughs> I know exactly what kind. <laughs> you will make an excellent judge. I have complete faith in your intellect and your will. You shall bring glory to our family. Stefan's congratulations follows your father's. Congratulations, brother. The simple folk could only dream of what you have already achieved. You can thank father and grandfather for this, for this opportunity, but it was you who proved yourself worthy. Once you receive your new lot, you and I will be equals at last. Yo, I love my brother. Yo, my brother's a cool fucking guy. Then some words of praise from mother and Nathan. You have brought your father much joy and made him proud, and I am witness to this. Now You now walk this path all thanks to him. Yet it saddens me that you did not consider the Divine Seminary, where you could have dedicated your life to our gods as well as the Empire itself. You worked so hard for this. We held a big feast, Your Honor, back home. I hope you achieved all you ever wanted. Yo, I'm fucking like 17. If I achieved all I ever wanted, just fucking kill me, dude. That, and at the very end, there's a small note from your sister. <laughs> fucking loser. Congratulations, good luck. Oh no. Robert likes me even more, maxed out. Stefan likes me even more, maxed out. Gloria doesn't like, like me as much, interesting. I thought I was gonna say my mom didn't like me as much, I was about to fucking lose it. This is so loud. In only a few days, it's only, it's, it's, let me try that again. It's only a few days since you became a student at the college. Your education has barely begun with an, with an amazing piece of news surprises all the students. Every year, Cornelius Tempest, the great chancellor and the emperor's younger brother, grants an honor to all future nobles of the mantle and invites them to a masquerade at his summer palace. That's weird. That's really weird. Is it just because I live in a, in a world where we have giant international pedophile cults that I find it pretty strange that the second most powerful person in all of the land invites all of the young men from the local college to his fucking summer home? <laughs> is it because of how fucked up my world is that, that, that I'm thinking this is weird or is this actually weird? It seems weird, right? A masquerade as well. Like, hmm, nobody will know who anybody is. Yeah. The professors and lecturers instruct you to look and act your best. Oh, look my best, huh? Oh, look my best, huh? On Epstein Island, you want me to look my best? In order to preserve the college's honor. They tell you about the ball too. All the, all those who attend it from the college, all who attend it from the college must prove themselves with word or deeds to be members of the great, to the members of the great Arctic dynasties. They'll be present there. <laughs> Fuck them. This means the reputation of your home province will be at stake too. Magra is a fucking free province, and I'll show them that. You know what I'm saying? Wear your tightest pants, always. It's time to get ready. I just do that for funsies anyway. It's time to get ready. You order a proper suit for the occasion and a mask to go with it. It looks simple, but by no means plain. And hide your... What does that mean? I don't know. And hide... And only hide your eyes. It's called a blindfold. You're wearing a blindfold. That's... You're gonna fucking... That's dumb. That's so dumb. <laughs> the day comes. You spend an entire morning preparing for the ball. Your fellow students give you hints about how to attach the cuffs, keep the collar straight, and make sure your hair remains coiffed for the entire night. Soon, the carriages start flocking to Cornelius Tempest's summer palace. The tall, ornate outer fence surrounds a sprawling garden in full bloom. The marble-paved driveway is so wide it can accommodate two rows of carriages. You and your fellow students walk up the massive stairs to the front door of the palace. You seem tiny and incongru incongruous against the background of this scenic grandeur. I bet you'll meet the Arknean princess here. Uh, yeah, probably, and we did, since we just stole from her, she won't have anything to say to us. But, uh, you know. Like most comic book robber ma- oh, yeah, that's probably right. But that doesn't actually cover your eyes. <laughs> like, that covers, like, your eyebrows and around your eye- But, like, literally, those masks do not cover your eyes, and this book just said it only covers your eyes. So that's a blindfold. Just wanna point that out. The Master of Ceremonies instructs all newcomers to seek their province's coat of arms. You see the banner of Magra from far away, depicting the silver tree digging its roots into the murky gray soil. Below it is the banner bearing the coat of arms of the Milanitis dynasty. Milanitis seem to be our guys as far as the Arcnians go. I'm gonna take a drink. It turns out students from the college were not the only ones invited to this party. You see academy cadets lined up beneath the banners too, and Tomas is among them. 
A wide grin appears in his face when he sees you go under the banner of Magra. I knew you'd be here today, pal. What can I say? Congratulations, student. As for me, I'm not so bad off myself. See, the military academy is father and mother to me now. I've killed my parents so that I could join the academy. His merry speech is interrupted by a tall, proud Arknia in a heavy cloak. You recognize him. He is Dorius Oten, Sophia's former master. Make way for your commander, soldiery. Last time you saw, saw Oten, he was searching the back streets of Anazat for your, by your house for a ser girl servant. But now the young Arknian's uniform betrays his high standing. He is young, yet he's already the province's commander. Who put him in charge of the military force of Magra is such an age? Who did that? I <laughs> like, who did that? I don't know, probably the guy in charge of the fucking province, right? Who did that? Who did th Who made him in charge of all the military forces of Magra at such a uh, young age? What's wrong? You know him or something? A brief description of Oten is enough to wipe the smile off his face. You see no other high-ranking officials bearing the colors of Magra at this party. It seems Dorius Oten will be your main representative of your province tonight. You watch the other college students and academy cadets line up under the provincial banners. The blue and silver banner of Arknia, the emperor's own province, is in the very center of the hall. Judging by the hilts jutting out from beneath their belts, many of those who surround that banner are nobles of the sword. Tomas is clearly jealous. The group from Arknia stands proudly, ennobled by its iconic and dignified history. The Arknian race and the empire originated in their very lands. What does it mean the Arknian race originated in their lands? That's interesting. That's interesting. Hmm. That could mean a lot of things. There's not really much of a point in speculating. It could mean some wild stuff, but it could also just mean nothing. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. They all are wearing full face masks. Yeah, they're using they're wearing those like movie movie magic like uh, rubber masks that you should wear when you commit robberies. Not that you should commit robberies, but... A sizable student group of students stand under the banner of Monia, a wealthy agricultural province signified by yellow grains on a field of... or... What? Yellow grains on a field of or... <laughs> Supposed to be orange? <laughs> Maybe orange? The wealth of the, of the young men beneath this banner is plain to see. Their attire is on par with the Arcneans in terms of luxury, perhaps even more vibrant in terms of color. Or, yeah, like, or what? The most numerous group of the party stands under the banner of Illyria, the yellow griffin across against a field of azure. All the Illyrians are clothed in well-tailored suits with a minimum of decoration. Illyria is where we are, right? No, it's, it's, which one is Illyria? This one. The industrial one with the guns. Yes, yes, got it, got it, got it, got it. Uh, some of them wear gloves. Most of them come from gloves. They, many, most of them come from wealthy industrial families, and it seems many of them would feel more at ease in their family factories than in a noble party like this one. Three banners represent the northern provinces of Fiona, Hermia, and Constanta. Is that up here? Yes. These banners, like the groups associated with them, stand together. <clears throat> the Royal Tempest Dynasty oversees all three of them. The students and cadets are mostly well off, are clearly well off, if they are dressed in modest, functional garments to honor the austere traditions of the North. And finally, the smallest of the groups is represented by an open book against a field of Ar Argent, Astinia, homeland of the Diamond Dynasty, which is here. Okay. Alright. Which is like fucking the Protestant realm. By order of Patriarch Junius Diamond, the open book of the new faith has been added to the banner only recently. Before that, it was just blank blue, or... <laughs> it didn't replace anything, it was added. Before that, we just had a blank flag, and it really always was missing something. Nearly all the young men beneath this banner are clothed in academy uniforms. Oh, all military... all Prussians. They wear no adornments, but are clad impeccably, with nary a button undone, the embodiment of rigor and restraint. The master of ceremony signals for the beginning of the party. It is time for dancing. The first dance is a minuet, and the tradition calls for everyone to dance. Harpsichord music fills the hall. The academy cadets waste no time finding dance partners, and soon already making the fluid motion float, and soon are already making the fluid first sips of the minuet. The typos are getting insane at this point, and I have to point out once again that this game is like 99.9% .9 fucking reading and words, and yet they are doing typos. 
like i mean i guess on the other hand you could make the argument that like yeah there's so many words that there's bound to be some typos but that's like come on dude that's like that's like saying i'm at a theme park that only does roller coasters so you know it's expected that there's so many roller coasters at least one of them's gonna fucking break and kill me it's like no no they should they're they're like it should be like experts on roller coasters you know <laughs> So, I will beat you, Yeoman, if I find any typos in your VN. They're on purpose. They're actually, you'll think they're, you'll think it's a typo, but it's actually going to be like really high IQ symbol of something. It's going to be meaning, but it's a feature, not a bug. You take a look around. One of the young ladies representing Magra catches your eyes. She is slender, like all Arknians. Oh, yeah, yeah, this fucking... And clothed in a yellow dress embroidered with a emerald green, her face hidden behind a full mask decorated with bright green feathers. What happens next seems unbelievable. The enigmatic lady walks towards you. She, the way she looks at you, the way she walks. The black eyes from behind her mask watch you closely. She tilts her head. There are no words, but you feel there is a question. Everyone in the hall is startled by a sudden noise. You look behind you and see Tomas getting up off the floor, his face a grimace of rage. Dorius Oten stands before him, eyeing him with disgust. His arm rests on the hilt of the sword. Who allowed this clumsy commoner inside the great chancellor's palace? Its noble masters are trying to dance, and it's getting underfoot. Was Dorius dancing with Tomas? <laughs> I really hope that's what was happening here. Tomas looks like he's going to explode in Oten's face. But the smug Arknian sword is a clear threat. If your friend's rage gets the better of him, he will end up in trouble. The enigmatic Arknian beauty, however, quickly loses all interest in the quarrel. She comes even closer to you, expecting you to invite her to dance. Um, I can resolve the quarrel with my diplomacy. I can not do this, because I would need willpower. Or I can just dance with the lady, which gives me more willpower. Tomas dislikes me slightly. Hmm. You approach Otten and apologize. I don't want to fucking apologize. Or you seize the day and dance with the beguiling Arknian lady. Surely Tomas can take care of himself. Something to be said about both of these. Do I act like a pussy? Or do I get pussy? You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh... I wish I could just say, like, fucking fight, fight the dude. Beat the shit out of the dude. But that's not an option. Um, let me just make sure. Octavia is the one who... Yeah, she's a Milanitis. I would like to point out that the Milanitises... You hate Arknians. You have to remember. Milanitis is the one group of Arknians who actually fights for the rights of humans. Remember, we, we said they will be hung last. So, it does make some sense to get this fucking Melanitis lady on my side so that I can, like, fucking, uh, you know, overthrow them with her on my, you know, you know what I'm saying? Every single woman in this book has been evil. Hmm. You realize that too late and made friend vows with Tomas. Yeah. But, like, I don't want to fucking be a pussy here. And I also really need willpower. I mean, like, really, really badly need willpower. Um, I'm at negative five. But your friendship. This, qu this isn't even, like, stand up for Tomas. This option is just fucking be a pussy and apologize to the guy. Like, no! If there was an option that said, fuck, like, th actually this option. This option would be the best. You help, you help Tomas to his feet and hurl some well-chosen words of mockery in Auden's face. That's actually the best answer by far. That's the good answer. I wish I could do that one. But I don't. I can't. Because I don't have any willpower. So I want to get willpower. Because this is a pussy option. Don't let her tempt you. I'm doing this option. I'm dancing with a lady. Watch this be a different fucking lady. <laughs> you should have gotten willpower. That's what I'm doing. You turn your head towards the Arcanine beauty and offer her your hand. Taking care not to rush your movements. A moment later, her fingers gracefully come to rest in yours. The masked lady's touch feels electric against your skin. You walk together to the center of the hall where other couples are already dancing. You bow and she makes a curtsy. Confirmed simp. 
I'm just trying to use this woman for political gain. If you don't understand that, then I'm sorry. You're just not operating on the same level as me, okay? Her hands are incredibly thin. They're so delicate you fear you might snap them if you squeeze too hard. I like that in a woman. You adjust to her steps, counting the rhythm of the music. Your lady for the dance is an Arcanian, a noble born to rule, and yet this dance where you must this is a dance where you must take the lead. I also, you know, I I believe in uh, I believe in cycles. I'm trying to make the same mistake my father made. <laughs> As you walk around her, your eyes catch an embroidered ornament on the arm of her dress. You spy many thin emerald threads, all interwoven into a pattern of interlocking snakes. Snakes? She wears snakes? I'm all- this is already a mistake. She wears snakes? Their symbol is a snake? If I'd known that, I would've- that's like fucking classic symbol of like, she will betray you. This young woman is Octavia Milanitis, daughter of the Archduke to your- oh, I know. The minuet ends. You bow to the lady and offer to accompany her wherever she chooses before the next dance. Why, then be so kind to accompany me for another dance! Before you know it, the night is almost over. Octavia will not let you go. She does not accept another invitation until she has danced with you three times. You spot Tomas in the crowd during a break. He catches your eye and salutes you with a wine glass. Judging from his lopsided grin, Ott must have had him removed from the dance floor. But any concern for your friend is forgotten when you see the beautiful Octavia approaching you again. Well, that's some pussy shit at the end there, but see, Tomas is fine. She remembers you from the days of youth. So she remembers that I fucking stole shit from her? You done fucked up. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't like that my relation with Tomas went down a little bit, but luckily we're bound by friendship. And I've got willpower, which is extremely important. Yeah, we're fine. My youth is flying by, by the way. You have lived yet another you have lived another year in the capital. Eterna has been shaken by what is now known as the Trial of the Fifty. Fifty people stand trial at once. Can you do that? That seems wrong. What if you only have Arcne and kids? How would that feel? Hmm. Hmm. Well, interesting. How would what would be the best way to solve that? Probably to marry her, so then our kids will be nobility of the sword, which will give us a lot of political power. But I won't actually have any kids with her. I'll have kids with a mistress and never sleep with her. And then threaten her life so that she doesn't tell anyone. Huh. That's probably the best way to do it, I'd say. It's probably the best way. Also, probably just don't marry her and just see if you can use her somehow. You know what I mean? I'll just commit adultery. Well, yeah, don't, 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 yeah, no, maybe don't do that. Hmm. Somebody read Dune. <laughs> exactly. A turn has been shaken by what is now known as the Trial of 50. 50 people stand- I'm just letting my options be open so that maybe I can take advantage of her at some point. But I guess we probably won't marry her or do anything. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see what options the game gives us. Not things I would do in real life, but things maybe that for the good of my race I will do in the game. All prominent members of several political circles. They are accused of treason and conspiracy against the crown. Hearing that plan of yours out loud actually wants me to die. Somebody hasn't read Dune. The accused spoke in favor of reducing the power of the nobles and granting more rights to the common estate. There was no mention of rebellion, yet these words, those words alone were enough to indict them. Every session of the trial is open to the public. It is a show of power made to discourage people from forming such cir circles ever again. You attend one of these sessions. The 50 face their verdict. Forced labor in the minds of Magra and Illyria for regular members, and true death for their leaders. Six men and one woman. The public execution takes place in the central square of Eterna. You remember the woman. Her name was Ani Siren. She made a speech before her execution. Why did they let her do that? I don't understand. Why did they let her do that? But... Mary Sophia. No. No, dude. She's a witch. Unless they reveal some information about witches not being bad, they're not actually fucking demonic evil people. In which case, we'll have to reconsider. But otherwise... Uh, even then, she's kind of fucked. You know? You know? A young woman, not too tall, her face almost plain, with long bangs over her eyes. She looks calm, even at this moment. You cannot believe she's about to leave this world forever. Annie Siren takes a look around before she speaks. Her voice is quiet, 
but you're close enough to hear every single word. She says that she is happy to give her lives, lives, fight, right, yeah, that makes sense, lives, fighting for the rights of the people. Her cause will never die, Ani claims. Just others like her will continue their work in hiding, for their cause is right and just. The best marriage choice is if that nun comes back who you said no to under the tree. I don't think nuns can get married. She is dragged away to, to the... Also, wasn't that a heretic? Or no, wait, was that the other one? Wait. No, yeah, there was that... No, wait. They put a sack over her head and tighten a noose around her neck. A hand yanks on the lever and the seven dangle in the air. Their feet tremble at first, then grow still. There are gasps and cries of discontent in the crowd. Oh no. Uh, the old nobility has gotten slightly more in power. Um, but also, we are uh, getting quite... Oh no, wait. We're actually... We got a little bit more order as well. Yo, hanging... Are you telling me hanging 50 people all at once work? Oh no, hanging, hanging 6 people. Hanging six people and arresting 50 and all this, that it works. It works. It fucking gives you power and it instills order. Good to know. I'm learning things from this game. When I start my own fucking tribal country, I know this now. Traitors hang and that will improve your country. Your studies at the Imperial College may have begun with a luxurious party, but soon you settle into a routine of lesson after lesson. Along with dozens of other future judges, you spend hours listening to lectures in spacious college halls with high ceilings. You study imperial law and legislation, analyzing every technicality and interpretation. The subjects only get tougher, and the instructors grow ever more demanding as your studies continue. School sucks. Yet law is not the only thing you study. There are other disciplines as well, such as rhetoric or orthog orthography. A true judge must have a perfect command of both the spoken and written word. Washing dark blue ink off your fingers becomes an indelible part of your daily routine. Of all your classes, you find the fencing lessons particularly exciting. Wait, what if the Arcneans just fucking use ink? <laughs> what if they're fucking fakers and they're just humans? You ever think about that? What if they're not? What if they're just humans? Of all your classes, you find fencing lessons particularly exciting. Every lesson covers your body with more cuts and bruises and makes your muscles ache from exertion, but your childhood dream is worth it. They just bathe in ink every day. Yeah. Yeah. People of the twins lot can marry. You must be getting confused with actual Christianity. This game confuses itself with Christianity fucking all the time. And also, yeah, I had no idea. They didn't mention anything about the, uh... They, they didn't mention that one way or another. So once again, you are spoiling the game, and I'm going to just, uh, I'm gonna fucking kick you next time, dude. Don't give me information that hasn't been revealed in the game, like, at all. Then finally, there's sh the short break in your studies. A handful of days for rest and recreation. You meet Tomas to discuss how you're gonna spend this time. There's a family in the Appalachians who have blue skin from incest. Interesting. Interesting. You're coming with me tonight. No excuses, Bronte. We visit, we'll be paying a visit to our mentor, Baron El, Cro El Cro Croy. <laughs> it's time you learned a thing or two about how we do things in the military. Your friend looks very cunning and pleased with himself when he says this. With a sigh, you change out of your college u uniform into your best clothes and follow him. Tomas rushes you to a two-story house somewhere in a noble neighborhood in the capital. Its windows are open and you can hear people talking over each other. The house's sitting room is filled with young people, at least two dozen men, almost all of them academy cadets. In the middle of the sitting room is an armchair, and in this armchair is a gentleman, and in this gentleman is the uniform of an Imperial Legion officer, and in this officer is a pipe. His thick hair falls over his large, observant eyes. Baron El Croy welcomes the two of you with a slight nod, and continues his speech while everyone else listens respectfully. As I was saying, young men, I firmly believe that the days when all the military glory of the Empire believed the Archean dynasties are long gone. Human nobles have been serving the Emperor at least as well as the Archean nobles for a long time now. Still, the Archeans keep acting like their origins are more important than honor and service to the crown. Take the Milanidas dynasty, for example. The Archdukes of Magra. Long ago, their leader, Char Milanitis, fermented a rebellion against the rule of the Tempest and the Twins' faith. Oh, the Milanituses were also her herit pa pagans? Heretics? Pa pagans? Interesting. Interesting. 
He sucked all life from his own land, doomed thousands of his own subjects, and yet the Milanidus dynasty still rules over Magra like nothing ever happened. Hmm. Then suddenly, Sir Elcroy flashes his... I know that's not how you pronounce it, but you can fuck off. A cunning grin. It's just the Spanish version of LaCroix. I think this calls for a test of your strategic thinking, young men. But first, let me refresh your memory on the rebellion of Char Milanitis. It may seem surprising, but we have him to thank for our current status. He was the first to ennoble humans, an act of unprecedented insolence. But it gave the rebellious duke immense support in his province. He risked his own reputation and title to make himself stronger thanks to humans. And in that he succeeded. Ooh, that's definitely some French Revolution things there. Interesting. No one had ever dared challenge the rule of the Archneans in Tempest before, but the rebellion of Magra changed everything. Humans became a part of the nobility. We got a taste of the power only the Archneans could wield before. Unless I'm mistaken, most nobles in the Empire these days are human. M Ooh, most. Why, we outnumber the members of the Archnean dynasties dozens of times over. So, Char Milanitis had complete rule and control over the lands of Magra. He had the loyalty of his ennobled human subjects, and he had the loyalty of the mages and witches who fled to Anazot, the only place in the Empire where they could hide from the church. Yo, fucking magic brigades. Interesting, interesting. The Archduke of Magra had everything he needed to win, and yet two pivotal changes brought him down. First of all, he cast a magic spell that incinerated the entire pro... pro why did he do that? <laughs> he was perfectly situated to win this war. He made two massive mistakes. One, he burnt down his own fucking land. Slight mistake. Small mistake. He should have done that a little differently. Two, the clergy... Wait, 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 wait. It certainly stopped the Imperial Legion in their tracks, but the population of Magra would no longer side with Charmelonitis after that. Imagine doing a scorched earth policy on your entire homeland. Period. I don't know. This. I said that like as if there was more to that. Imagine doing that. Imagine if like... Hmm. Yeah. That's like the Germans are like marching towards Moscow. And the Russians are doing... Yeah, you know, they're, the Soviets are doing uh, like scorched earth shit. But they're just like, let's just burn all of it down right now. You know, like I know they're not in Kamchatka, <laughs> but let's just burn that down too. Let's, you know, I know they haven't reached like the fucking, you know, Siberia, but like, you think maybe we just spread salt over all of it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Second, the clergy struck at the rebellious duke with the power of the twins. His magic was gone and his main advantage was no more. Many fled. But as you know, it still took the Empire an entire month of siege before the palace in Anazot was taken. I guess he tried to burn down towns to keep the invaders from resupplying. But why all of your land at once? I know, it sounds like he fucked up, like his magic. Also, I'd like to point out that this guy's two points kind of contradict each other, right? Like, his first mistake was using magic to burn down his entire province. His second mistake was not being able to use magic. <laughs> now wait a minute. <laughs> now wait a minute. So, I mean, it's like... Yeah, okay. I'm assuming one, then the other happened. You know, they didn't happen at the same time, but it's still just kind of funny. Go big or go home. That's what I say, dude. After, I say that just as a non sequitur, but I do say it, you know, go big or go home, skate or die, dude. After the rebellion of Magra, the empire changed drastically. And most importantly, humans finally received their lawful right to be ennobled. Why? Again, I ask. Again, I ask why. Because, um, like, just for instance, uh, imagine, I'm trying to think of a good example. What's a good comparison to real life in this sort of situation? Imagine if the state of Rhode Island <laughs> decided tomorrow that we don't want to pay taxes. And we're going to tell everyone in our state that taxes don't exist anymore. 
And the U.S. government says, you can't do that. You can't do that. You gotta pay taxes. You gotta pay federal taxes. You gotta pay us taxes. And so the U.S. government marches their troops on Rhode Island and destroys Rhode Island, takes it over. And then they say, well, I guess nobody in Rhode Island has to pay taxes anymore. I guess taxes are over. In fact, in all of the United States, taxes are over. That's what happened here. <laughs> like, that is, that is actually what happened here, is that... Oh yeah, so this province of Magra rebelled, and as part of their rebellion, they uh, gave humans noble titles. And then we took it over, and we said, well, the rebels already gave them titles, what are we gonna do? Undo that? It's like, yeah, they were rebels. You fucking just destroyed them. Obviously, laws that would have changed during the rebellion would be go would go back, right? It's also like, imagine if there was some like religious uh, secession, right? Where like some country like that's that's like Protestant has some part of it secede because they're Catholic. And they're like, we're all Catholic now. Catholic is the official state religion of our new country. And then the Protestants take them back over. And they're, and they're just like, okay, well, I guess you guys are all Catholic now. You can just, you're just allowed to do that. Um, even though before it was like completely illegal. Now you're just, it's just allowed because you did it while you were rebelling. It's like, what? Actually, that kind of thing kind of did happen in the in English history a little bit. But not to that degree. You know what I mean? Like, it happened a little bit. But... Hmm. Maybe there were other provinces on the brink of rebellion. I don't know. It's just interesting. It's just a strange, strange thing to do. I assume the god stripped Char of magic after committing that devastation to his province. Yeah, pro it seems that's sort of implied. But that's interesting. Well, or, it's implied either that the twins took away his magic, or it's like what happened in real life, where after the time of Christ, certain types of, like, weird demonic magic shit stopped working. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty common. Uh, humans finally received their lawful right to be ennobled, and I'd like to stress that in particular, ennobled not by birth, but by virtue of their own knowledge and talent. This dude doesn't seem very smart, so maybe he's just fucking up the story. Maybe. That's also true. You never know. History, young man, is more than just a memory of our of the past. It is also a lesson for the future. I believe our part of history proves my point. I, and now a test. Tell me, if you were among the Imperial strategists during the rebellion, how would you have done? What would you have done? How would you have fought an enemy as powerful as Char Milonitis? With this, Sir Elkoyz leans back in his armchair and takes a pull from his pipe while the cadets start discussing. Some of them take no time to say they can't believe Sir Elkoyz thinks humans were first known by serving the rebellious duke. Wait. Others say the prolonged policy, they don't, they can't believe that? Isn't that what happened, though? Is this a conspiracy theory? <laughs> <laughs> Others say the prolonged palace siege must have may, might have been a mistake, and storming the palace would have been a better choice. Soon ideas start flying. Some cause only laughter, while others lead to debate. They're discussing the past of Anazat, the past of your hometown. You cannot possibly stay silent right now. If you were in command of the Imperial Legions back then, what would you have done? Based on what you know about the Rebellion of Magra, you see three potential strategies. The first involves calling upon the Twins' miracles to rob Melanitis of magic and render him powerless. That's what they did. The second entails putting your faith in the dis discipline and or valor of the army and for a frontal assault. The third means drawing out the siege while making the, lives, the enemy's life as hard as possible through cunning. It's not very cunning to just starve them to death, but I guess okay. Um, so either get my valor and theology up, interesting. Get my valor and eloquence up, or get my valor and scheming up. Ooh. First of all, I want to take a look at my stats here. Um, it's at nine that I get better. So scheming and eloquence are both pretty close. So it would probably make the most sense to pick one of those. Would I rely on the will of the twins? Maybe. Would I pr press for a decisive assault? Maybe. And lay siege? Maybe. Those are all reasonable. Hmm. It's 10 that you get better. That's what I meant. I don't know why I said 9. I meant 10. <laughs> His name is El Croy. He's a sparkling water friend. Yeah, dude. It makes me want to fucking La Croy. I'm actually... Ha, his name is Char because he charred his province. <laughs> Got him. Uh, I feel like... 
this decision is not that important. It's just me having a discussion with these guys. So I don't need to worry too much about like which is more fucking role play because they're all just like, oh yeah, I think this was would have been a good idea. Um So I feel like just decisive or siege, and I think this I think decisive. I'm the based on how what we've been doing so far, a charge like this, yeah, no pussy shit. That's kind of like what our character's been like as well. So I'm gonna um yeah, I'm gonna do that. Decisive assault. My Valor, by the way, is getting fucking sick. It's fucking 19. I'm one away from max, dude. You decide it's time for you to answer, Sir El Croy. You begin by stating that you yourself hail from the city of Anazot. The cornerstone of the rebellious duke's strategy was ennobling humans, you say. This won their loyalty and formed them into a veritable army. An army loyal to its leader can achieve any feat of valor, so the Imperial Legions also ought to have relied upon the valor and unity of their soldiers. Inspire the warriors, earn their loyalty, and take the castle by the storm. By the storm. That is not how that phrase goes. That is the way! Sugma grind set. Sugma balls, dude. Sir El Croy looks at you, studying you attentively. Bronte, is that your name, young man? I'll make sure to remember it. You are absolutely right. He's a military commander of the Eternal Legion. A gifted general, he swiftly rose through the ranks despite his humble title and modest wealth. The first... Modest wealth? The first human ever to be allowed to teach military strategy at the Military Academy of Eterna. The soldier's loyalty to their creed, their commander, their emperor, these are the things that make for an undefeatable army. And I wholeheartedly agree. A decisive assault would have brought down the castle at the rebellion's very inception and then destroyed all their will to fight. And this young man is the moral of the story. Charmelinius was defeated, but not by the clergy and their prayers, and not even by the noble militias assembled by the other archdukes. He was vanquished by the imperial legions. Yo, I feel like we're going down the Napoleon line, the Napoleon route. It's kind of cool. I don't know. Maybe we'll be fucking crowned emperor, dude. He was vanquished by the Imperial Legions, a unified army with a clear regulations and ranks and a clear chain of command. An army that is strong and disciplined and loyal to the Emperor. Long ago, only Archneans had the right to wield weapons and wage war, but now humans can prove their merit and earn the same right. Humans like ourselves. And the present Empire has grown even stronger due to its new warriors and functionaries. These days, humans can judge and rule and create. The terrors wrought by the rebellious Duke are undeniable. It is rebellion created new possibilities for all of us, including you, young Sir Bronte. He nods to you in approval, then his eyes finally move away from you and back to the rest of the young men in the hall. After hearing him praise you, no one dares to argue with the battle-hardened officer. The evening continues. Sir El Croy shares some of his war stories, each one more astounding than the last. Who do they go to war with? Who do they go to war with? This is a really, really serious question. I have no fucking idea. Who do they go to war with? This entire fucking map is owned by you. Maybe this piece? Maybe this piece here? <laughs> is that it? Dumbass is like Char! <laughs> yeah, okay. That makes sense. That's not much, though. That's kind of... It's got to be kind of rare, though, right? Hopefully you can find another continent and conquer it. Mm-hmm. Said that the Empire is the only country on the continent. That's what I'm saying, dude. We need to break apart so we can actually get some fucking shit done again. Warfare. But yeah, his... His war stories, what the fuck? What, what, what could they be? You join Tomas and the other cadets in sipping wine and enjoying his tales. I wish they told me the tales. You return to the college long after midnight. You often recall Baron El Croy's story about the rebellion of Char Milanitis after that. The rebellious duke lost the war... Yet he brought about drastic changes for humans and the entire empire. Killing bandits and peasants. Wow, real fucking impressive, Commander. Really impressed by you. There are days when you receive letters from home. Father's writing is very reserved. He mostly discusses events and work in Magra and writes very little about the family. It makes me proud that you've managed to teach Stef Stefan- I have managed to teach Stefan how to handle our affairs at home. Your older brother behaves impeccably at society balls and receptions we host. He has already made several crucial acquaintances. But Gloria has a different opinion of Stefan. She thinks your older brother's taking more and more after Grandfather. Stefan's a lot like Grandfather. It's in his manners, his posture, his voice. He even dresses just like him. He used to be aloof around me. We barely talked in the past, but now he just always blames me and tears me apart. 
I can't take it anymore. He walks all over me all the time and treats me like a housemaid. I thought you, like, fucking... I thought he changed. I thought he changed. Or do people never change? Mother writes to you. From her letters, you learn that Nathan just barely managed to graduate from school. Makes me sad to admit that Nathan has none of the talents you have. Well, you know. What can you do? What a fucking dork. It's probably because you tried to kill him at a young age. Probably, like, uh, messed him up. The other day, he told me he won't even try to study in the capital. He says he won't be able to pass the exams. I find solace only in the nights Nathan and I spend together reading the scriptures and our walks to the church by the silver tree. He accompanies me every time. Your sister and younger brother write about Mother, too, and they say the same thing about her health. She now spends more time locked in her chambers to brood. Gloria does, does her best to accompany Mother when she leaves home, and Nathan's letter mention her steps echoing in the halls in the middle of the night. There's one more thing Nathan mentions in his letters. Stefan and Gloria have been fighting often these days. Stefan always tries to get under Gloria's skin, and she answers him in kind. Then Stefan calls her a lowly commoner to make her shut up. You always tremble in excitement each time you hear a new letter with the seal of your family province. I love hearing about my family. Fucking hate each other. It fucking warms my heart. Your fate is still bound tightly to your families, no matter the distance between you. Oh no. My relations went down with Stefan for literally no fucking reason. Oh no, my relations with Gloria went down for fucking no reason. Oh no, my relations with Nathan went down for no fucking reason. Wow, thanks game. F why? I thought distance made the heart grow fonder. You would become a judge one day, so you were sent by the prefecture of Eterna to the prefecture of Eterna to be mentored by a more experienced colleague. Your mentor is a judge of, of considerable age, a noble of the mantle with a proud bearing about him. He never misses a chance to remind you that being mentored by such an experienced man of office is a great honor. Your mentor entrusts you with his minor cases and, to his great joy, his night shift. You are growing distant in them. Distance makes the heart grow fonder. Duh. Duh, everybody knows that. Nathan has brain damage from heavy shaking. Hmm. You just have to kill him and then it'll fix itself up. That's probably true. I have to kill my brother. Uh, I'm gonna get some water real quick. My throat is already bugging me and that's a bad sign. So I'm gonna be right back. In case anyone was wondering, by the way, I found out recently just how effective dry fasting is. This is a fucking life hack in case anybody... And this, this is just, you know, I'm just giving you a little bit of a, a, an option. A life hack, definitely. Uh, I found out that if you dry fast all day, then when you finally eat at the end of the day, you can eat fucking anything and you won't gain weight. And I'm telling you, like, I I had Thanksgiving dinner, right? Like, normally I eat pretty healthy. I eat raw food. You know, raw meat, milk, eggs. But it was Thanksgiving. I went over to Dalton and Sarah's with my fiancé. And, uh, oh yeah, by the way, I actually put the ring on my fiancé's finger yesterday. So we're officially engaged. But, uh, went over there to have dinner. It was a nice time, you know. I'm eating Thanksgiving dinner. I'm not going to, like, not eat Thanksgiving dinner. So make an exception to the diet and everything. Uh... Hadn't ate or drank anything all day until Thanksgiving dinner. And then I'm eating fucking turkey. I'm eating stuffing. Did they have stuffing? They didn't have stuffing. They had, what was it? Green bean casserole. Had fucking yams. Had, uh, had, uh, a beer. Had, uh, apple pie and pumpkin pie. Like, all this fucking food. Gravy. Fuck, like, all this shit. And, uh, eggnog, like, just tons of fucking food. I was, like, I felt like I was dying by the end of it. I checked my weight the next day. I lost 0.2 pounds. It, not like that's a huge loss, obviously. But, like, I ate massive fucking Thanksgiving dinner, and I lost weight. I'm telling you, dude, dry fasting is, like, is, like, is uh is like a secret code to life you could just do whatever you want and like you'd still lose weight so congratulations yeah thanks thanks yeah i'm engaged so that's kind of cool yeah, yeah you, know, you know you know that's cool <laughs> <laughs> another night begins the office is growing darker you're still there zealously filling out the paperwork for the day a petty th theft your shit gonna be massive dude <laughs> I don't know, dude. Cheers. Cheers to massive shits! A 
a verbal assault against the noble of the sword by the co by a commoner. A fine for the parents of children who covered an imperial institution with obscene drawings. Petty cases, all of them. But there are real cases a judge has to face. So you sit by you sit there, carefully comparing complaints, statements, and witness testimony. Then the door to your office swings open. A gendarme drags in a provocatively dressed girl. Her golden hair is undone and her makeup is a fiery red. Girls like her sell their bodies in the house of houses of ill repute. What do I have to fucking arrest this prostitute? Whatever. Throw her away. The next to enter the office is a stout priest. My man. No! A, his face adorned by a nose of remarkable shape and huge wart on the cheek. You do your best to avoid staring at it. That's one of those situations. The character's ugly because he's ugly inside. You know what I'm saying? That wart is a sign. He got that wart from fucking herpes. The gendarme gives his report. The girl was arrested by a certain gentleman in the park by the Temple of the Twins. They were commuting acts of carnality and an affront to the faith. The huffing and puffing priest interrupts him and starts yelling. He saw her doing magic, he did. The gentleman was enthralled by the girl. He was glowing like a lamppost. Wait. You ask the priest to stay quiet and ask the gendarme can prove this. He only shrugs. He didn't see anyone glowing. He arrested the girl for her sacrilegious conduct alone. The man in her company was a noble, so the gendarme couldn't bring himself to arrest him. <laughs> Come on, dude. Okay, so the so the priest didn't sleep with a woman. That's good. He's just saying that the woman's a witch. Got it. He remembers her, his name. The priest is huffing and puffing even louder now. It was magic, he screams. You must refer this case to the Inquisition. This witch was loose in the streets of the Empire's illustrious capital, seducing good men with her vile charms. The girl stays quiet all the while. Her eyes are emerald green, twinkling with gold as she looks at you. When she does speak, her voice is soft, like smooth velvet. Alis? I don't know her. Oh, we have a quest for her. That's where I know the name. Alis' rescue. Yeah, I don't know about that. I'm probably going to kill this bitch. I'm probably going to kill this bitch, you know what I'm saying? My name is Alis, Your Honor. All I did was obey the noble gentleman's wish. He wanted my affection right by the temple, and I dared not oppose him. I did not defy my lot, did I? Oh, interesting, interesting. Why are you so scantily dressed, though? You were clearly asking for it. It would hold up in court if it wasn't for the fact that you were a whore. Good try, though. Nice try. But if she was, like, fully clothed, I'd be like, oh, okay, makes sense. Like, like, yeah, she has a point where she could say, do say no to the guy, but, uh, mm. The man is to blame. He was weak enough to fall for her magics. This fucking idiot deserves to go to jail because he didn't put any points in willpower. Dude, I mean, you made a, you made a build that's weak to mind magic. What do you fucking think's gonna happen? That's your fault. That's your fault. You should have invested in some sort of, like, tinfoil hat item so that, because, to, to make up for your low willpower. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you're in jail. Sorry. The wench looks up and meets your gaze as she says this, these words. I like how the d narrator describes her as a wench as well. Her eyes reflect the candlelight in the dusk, spent sending sparks of gold dancing across the walls. That's a witch. The gendarme stands awkwardly by the door, sighing. The priest goes off on another rant. You tell him, not, you tell him to be quiet. The day is not over yet. You must decide how to resolve this unusual case on your own. The law says a judge must investigate all circumstances related to the case. You know the name of the nobleman who has seen this, who was with this girl in the throes of passion. Gendarm was afraid to question him, but you are a future nobleman yourself, a young judge. Surely you can find a way to resolve this matter with discretion and get the information you need from the nobleman. But perhaps the suspicious lady of the evening, Alice, is at the heart of the matter. You'll have no doubt she'll reveal her true colors if you question her. Why? If the priest was right about her using magic, the girl's fate is sealed. Your Honor, you're making fucking magic noises, you dumb bitch. What do you think's gonna happen to you? You look up from your desk and into the eyes of the beautiful Alis, and you suddenly feel as though a divine light is shining upon you. This emotion flows like a river. It lifts you up. This is more than beauty, more than passion. This is much, much more. Will you resist this call, or will you he heed it? It's fucking magic. Uh, find the nobleman. Or interrogate Alis, which will cause her to die. That's really fucking strange. <laughs> <laughs> Asking her questions will fucking kill her. So I could release her. Why the fuck would I do that? Willpower, I guess. 
I could find the nobleman. Um, or, and get diplomacy, which would be nice. Or I use five willpower to get manipulation and theology and she just fucking dies. I mean, to be honest with you, I would... She's using prostitution magic right in front of us. Don't interrogate her, she'll charm you. What do you mean? It says she'll fucking die is what's gonna happen. Hmm. Something is off about the streetwalker. You have to find the truth, even if it's the last thing you do in this life. But it says I... It doesn't say I'll die. So even though that's fucking... Uh, hmm. Interrogating her seems to lead to her being guilty. That means she must be guilty, right? I'm gonna interrogate her. That's what I would do in this situation. I would interrogate her before going to find the nobleman. Do one thing at a fucking time. She's right in front of you, so just do that first. You can talk to the nobleman later if you need to. You dismiss the priest and gendarme and begin questioning Alice. You are alone with the harlot now. She traces lines on your table absentmindedly with her finger. Her dress still reflects the candlelight, scattering it into golden specks across the wall of the office. By the way, I want to mention... Has anyone here, do you guys have more experience driving in snow and shit like that and ice and stuff like that? Because I'm from, you know, the desert. It never snowed ever. Now I live somewhere where there's snow all the fucking time, basically, after a certain point in the year. And it seems to be perfectly fine with a four-wheel drive car. But I've noticed that, like, like there are situations where I'm driving and it's like, ooh, if I didn't have a four-wheel drive car, I would have died just there. Or like, ooh, if I didn't have anti-lock brakes, I would have died just then. Like today, I was driving. And it's like three times my anti-lock brakes turned on. And it's like, uh, I didn't do anything. Like, like it was fine. It was no problem at all. I wasn't even close to dying. But if I didn't have anti-lock brakes, I would have died. <laughs> do you have studded wheels? No. I have new-ish tires. They're good. All They're all-weather tires that I got from a shop up here. That like, But, like, they're not specifically winter tires. You know what I mean? Good condition tires. Brand new. So they do well, but they are not, they don't have chains on them or anything. Uh, scammed, not, I know, I know they're not winter tires, I know that. Drive slowly and use four wheel drive on slick icy spots. Yeah, that's what I've been doing, I've been fine. But it's just funny, yeah, cause like I said, Dalton's wife tried to drive somewhere and just couldn't go anywhere cause she has a two wheel drive car. And it's like, yeah, but uh, that, <laughs> that, that makes sense. You dismiss the priest and the gendarme and begin questioning Ailis. Oh, by the way, I want to mention something real quick. I just want to brag about my uh, wife-to-be. Um, this is how lucky... Uh, lucky, not really, because I'm like a, you know, like... I wouldn't say it's luck, because I'm like obviously a fucking catch, and she's lucky. But, like, we're such a good fit, and I just want to tell you one thing that shows just how well, how good of a fit this is. I wanted to make sure that she knew that I hold political opinions that are controversial right so i was you know i was talking to her about like what's an example of one that i can say on stream the uss liberty i was telling her about the uss liberty which is a american vessel that was shot at by israeli forces during the six-day war in i believe 1967 and like 30 uh, American troops were killed uh, despite Israel supposed to be our ally. And uh, I was telling her about that, just making sure she knows that I believe in like controversial things. That's not controversial, that happened for a fact, but you know what I mean. And uh, it was late at night when we were talking over the phone. She fell asleep because, and she told me like, oh yeah, my, my dad's like, a, like, he talks about this kind of shit all the time. So like, no, I know. <laughs> it's like, yes. <laughs> Like, you know, dude, you've gone past a certain point when you're talking about like, yeah, like 32 fucking American civilians were killed by the Israelis and she's like, yawn. <laughs> I already know that. Come on. You're alone with the harlot now. She traces lines on the table absentmindedly with her finger. Her dress still reflects the candlelight sparkling in the golden sparks specks across the walls of the office. With the four-wheel drive car, you can go anywhere you want, he said to himself. <laughs> it rarely snows where I live, but we occasionally get ice here. It's the only reason I own a four-wheel drive vehicle. Oh, yeah, up here, they said, like, you need... To, like, everyone I talked to when I was buying a car, they're like, you need a four-wheel drive car. Don't buy anything else, you'll fucking die. There's no... I mean, there's just no way around it. Like, you have to buy a four-wheel drive car. How could your greatest ally do something like that? Must have been a mistake. 
I don't know, there was an American flag. At first, they claimed that there was no American flag, so they didn't know. They thought it was an Egyptian ship, which didn't make any sense because the Egyptians didn't have any ships. But, and it was clearly an American vessel. But they claimed, well, there was an American flag. But some of the survivors said, mm, not only was there an American flag, but after they shot down the first one, we raised another. So... <laughs> you send something unnatural in these sparks of gold. You have seen these sparks before once as a youth. See, I knew she was a witch. Yeah, let's see. You recall a sunset in Nenazot, an abandoned house, and Sophia's deep blue eyes. You cannot help but share the priest's concerns. The questioning begins. You ask Aelis how she makes a living. Your honor, my dream is to become an actress and join the Imperial Theater, but I am just a poor girl of low birth. How else am I supposed to earn my keep? That, are, is that a real question? Are you asking me this for real? How else am I... You know how it is. There's only one job in the world, and it's prostitution. I need to... I need to earn a living. What am I supposed to do? I'm a prostitute. That's the only choice I have. It's like... We live in a different kind of city than I thought. You know what I mean? I thought this was a kind of city where you could just fucking be anything. Clean houses, dude. Like, I don't know. Be a cashier farm i don't know do anything marry a dude who's like does okay for himself oh but no you want to be an actress maybe you fucking get your priorities straight lady fucking jeez although if you want to be an actress selling your body is something you should get used to you know what i'm saying uh her tirade is none her trade is none of your concern you explain however engaging in depravity next to a holy site is an affront to the twins did the U.S. miss a payment or something? Is that why they got shot at? It's complicated. Look into it. You should look into the USS Liberty is all I would say. Uh, they must have thought it was Liberian. Oh, oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah, Liberian thousands of miles away, lost in the Gulf. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> Ayla smiles craftily and fire flashes in her eyes. The light in her eyes beckons, promising to take you somewhere far away. You quietly pray to the younger to deliver you from this temptation for the sake of justice. An affront to the gods. On the contrary, your honor, I serve the twins. Their love flows within me. I want, and I grant it to anyone who asks. Oh, this whore. That is, uh. Aelis rises from the chair, licensed. She is glowing, literally. The light emanating from her is bright enough to illuminate the entire room. This is neither my vice nor my folly, your honor. It was the twins' will that I be born this way. I do not control people. I do not cloud their minds. All I do with my gift is help them feel the love of our gods, which they have forgotten. And, this, and the gods themselves bless me for this. Had the twins hated magic as much as the Inquisition pretends, they would have never allowed me to be born. Uh, no, you just got possessed by a demon. It's actually extremely simple, and I'm surprised nobody has told you this before. This is a confession. Aelin, confession. Aelis is a witch. Does she not realize the fate that must await all witches? She thinks she's bewitching you. Take a drink. Did Liberia have ships like that? What? Well, no. America's also thousands of miles away. Yeah, but America's America. We're fucking everywhere. Yes, I was born a witch. What am I supposed to do, your honor? Also, isn't Israel really just an American colony in the Middle East? So really, we were incredibly close. But then again, is is Israel an American colony in the Middle East? Because then why would they attack us? So, then again, we attacked our colonial overlords in the past. So maybe it's just a long-stranding tradition, you know? <laughs> I don't think so. Yes, I was born a witch. What am I supposed to do, your honor? Get myself burned at the stake by the Inquisition? Maybe just don't use witchcraft. Or become their mindless collared puppet. Maybe don't be a prostitute. Is this how I'm supposed to find my way to the peak? No, I will, I will live my life my way. And if the twins judge me guilty in the hereafter for bringing their love to the people, then so be it. They will. You're a fucking idiot. The case is closed. The girl's a witch who uses her sorcery to beguile the mind. She confessed as much herself. You must send for the Inquisition, Inquisition now. There's no other way. Such is the law. I hoped you could see, Sir Bronte. I hoped you could recognize their love when it touches you. I feel sorry for you. Stern-looking priests enter your office, accompanied by armed champions of the faith. The Inquisitors examine the girl closely, study your notes, and thank you for catching the witch. Job well done, boys. The champions of faith lock a collar around her neck. The golden glow in her eyes is gone. Yo, wait. So they have an anti-magic collar. Why not just like... I mean, like, a killer, that's fine. 
But like, if she had turned herself in, she talked about her options. What am I supposed to do? See, wait. Uh, become their mindless collared puppet? Is that what they do? Does she actually become mindless or does it just get rid of the magic? It's not like a fucking lobotomy, right? Maybe, I guess. I don't know. Three days later, pretty Alice is born at the stake in Majesty Square. Cool dude. Burn, bitch. Burn, bitch. I'm at negative five willpower. No, I'm at zero willpower. And I got a little bit more manipulation theology, which is, like, worthless for me. Cool. I'm proud for you finally killing a witch like you should have with Sophia. Based, she fucking died. <laughs> Two major events take place while you're busy living your life. First, Cornelius Tempest is no longer the great chancellor of the Empire. What? He has been ousted and sent back to his province. His replacement is the Archduke of Monia. Woo! Egerius Monrogue, the same Monrogue who sought to shut down the college. The most powerful lord in the realm finally convinced the emperor to give his brother that his brother Cornelius was giving too much freedom to the lowborn. Holy shit, dude. There's going to be some race riots. Now the policies of the empire will be reversed. Many fear that the new great chancellor may destroy the imperial code of laws and other achievements of Cornelius. There are cautious rumors among the people. They say that the new great chancellor is going to revoke the right of the common lot to be ennobled by the mantle. Secondly, Magra, your homeland, has a new overseer, Gaius Tempest, the other brother of Emperor Uther II. Normally, the overseer of a province is an archduke. After all, it makes sense for the province's most powerful noble to impart the emperor's will to the locals. Yet this age-old tradition has been broken, and to no one's surprise, Archduke Tarquinius Milanitis is absolutely furious. That is why I fucking said hi and did a little dance, made a little love, get down tonight with the Milanitis girl. Because, look at this dude, look at the intrigue. You know who would be a great guy to have on my side for a race war? The leader of my home province, who's trying to regain his role as the leader of the home province. Honestly... Honestly, maybe we strike a little deal with them. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. You, you, I, the enemy of my enemy is my man I take advantage of for the time being. Gaius Tempest used to be the main supporter of his brother, the former great chancellor Cornelius Tempest. The nobles of the emperor's court say this is a stratagem by the Archean gentry who want Gaius removed from court affairs along with Cornelius. Either way, Gaius Tempest and Darquinius Mil Milanitis great names fucking great names tarquinius will be at each other's throats over the province this does not bode well for their future balkanization now i'm ready the only one only one thing is clear magra your home province is about to face great changes okay so the nobility lost some power which is really strange considering that um really Oh, no way. Uh, yeah, the nobility lost some power, which is really strange considering what just happened was something that gave the nobility power. And there's more peace, which is really strange considering that what just happened is something that caused more unrest. So that's kind of fucking strange. Uh, calm before the storm, I guess. <laughs> the capital is preparing for a great celebration. The coming of age of Jerrion Tempest, heir to the throne. The streets are being cleaned, the lowborn merchants are gone from the squares, and flags and flower garlands have appeared by the buildings. By the Emperor's decree, everyone will celebrate for the next three days. Oh, it might be time to... Yeah, I have to, uh... <sighs> it's fucking early. I'm sorry, dude, I'm sorry. It's an early stream today, I'm sorry. Uh, a short stream. I gotta go, I gotta go, uh, give Dalton a hand. So, uh, I'm gonna fucking, I gotta go. I'm sorry.